Athletes, officials and journalists from some countries will now have to undergo daily COVID tests for seven days before they can leave for Tokyo. The countries are India, Afghanistan, Maldives, Nepal and Sri Lanka, where the Delta strain of the virus is rampant. All other international athletes have to do two tests in the four days leading up to their departure for Japan. The Japanese government has also mandated that all teams will have daily tests while in Tokyo. With half of Australia under lockdown, it's no surprise that some of our Olympians have been caught up in the evolving restrictions and border closures. Earlier this week, some of the swim team had been in Townsville and Magnetic Island before they were declared hotspots. Those members of the squad were kept separate from the rest of the group at the training camp in Cairns. They also underwent testing, despite being considered low-risk contacts, and were cleared. Meanwhile, Australia's men's and women's hockey teams are hoping border restrictions won't prevent them from relocating to Darwin from Perth next week. The Australian Olympic Committee says it's working closely with all sports to ensure they have their COVID-safe plans in place. Quite a few Australian teams will head to Tokyo from their overseas-based camps. One of those is the Matildas, whose squad for Tokyo has been named, with six players heading to their first games. It'll be the second time around for forward Kaya Simon, who joined me earlier from Sweden, where the team is currently based. I asked her what impact the new coach, Tony Gustafsson, has had on the team. One way I could describe Tony's uh, coaching style would definitely be his attention to detail. Um, and I guess for us previously, maybe that's been what's led us down in major tournaments previously is the smaller details, you know, whether it be, you know, a small little attention to details with our defensive shape or our attacking or just really fine details that, that sometimes could get missed or, or maybe not as much detail on those things previously. Um, but yeah, I think we're really tuning into that and really resonating with us and everyone's kind of learning and adapting. And um, it's been really nice for me and refreshing, I think. And, and hopefully that's what we need to take us you know, further in this tournament. He's obviously had previous previous experience coaching the US so he knows them fairly well he's Swedish himself so he would obviously know the Swedish team and New Zealand we've faced them several times and they're our, our um, you know our rivals um, back in Australia so it, it is going to be a tough group but I also think that the Olympic Games is is tough because there's smaller amounts of teams anyway so um, I do feel well prepared and we still have another few weeks of preparation under our belt so I'm really looking forward to seeing how we look come that first game against New New Zealand. I've spoken to Lydia Williams, the goalkeeper, about this before. Um, there, there's an added layer, I think, um, by being one of the Indigenous players on the team and what that means for your people and for Australia more broadly. Um, but is it the right thing to ask you about that? Like, does not make any difference or is it just you're all the same and, and it doesn't have any other extra added value? Yeah, look, I think for me and, and Lydia, I could probably speak on her behalf as well, is we're very proud of our culture and our heritage and, um, you know, being Indigenous Olympians. Um, and I think uh, I take a lot of pride in in knowing that and carrying myself in a way that I know that it, I could potentially be, you know, a positive role model for so many young Indigenous kids back home in Australia. And it really resonates with me on a personal level because Cathy was my inspiration as a nine-year-old girl sitting in my lounge room watching the Olympic Games back in 2000. So um, to think of the fact that I could potentially have that impact on some other young kids and hopefully inspire them to follow their sporting dreams or their career dreams one day is definitely something that I have in the back of my mind. And it's something that I'm so privileged and proud that I can be, you know, one of only a few um, Indigenous Olympians, but I'm hoping I can look down the track in 20 years time and have double or triple the amount of Indigenous Olympians having represent our country. Kaya Simon, one of the 51 Indigenous athletes to have represented Australia at the Olympic Games since 1896. 
Now, Gronje Somerville will be making her Olympic debut in Tokyo, named in the Australian badminton team. She'll team up with Setiana Mapasa in the women's doubles and Simon Leung in the mixed doubles. And Gronje joins us now. Gronje, congratulations for making the team. I know um, early on, you know, we were talking about the incredible impact that all of those Olympians have had that came before you. And you mentioned to me that you think about not just the successes, but the hard work and the gruelling times that have gone in behind making an Olympic team. What have you gone through to get to this point? Yeah, I mean, every athlete has to be at their prime performance to qualify for an Olympics. And given the current state of the world, it's definitely been a testing time. Um, we've had to, you know, overcome a lot of travel restrictions, um, times where we weren't able to train. And now leading up to our direct Olympic preparation, there's obviously a lot of lockdowns within Australia. So I'm separated by both my doubles partners right now and could potentially be until Tokyo. So yeah, it's kind of every athlete has to be super adaptive in this situation and um, just do what they can to stay in peak physical condition. So how do you do that, knowing that you might not be playing until you get to Tokyo, but you've got to maintain that performance level? How do you ride that roller coaster? Yeah, so I've um, just kind of been resigned to the fact that we just need to get to Tokyo in one piece and pretty much control what we can and can control until then. So just keeping up our own personal training as much as we can, um, staying fit, staying healthy, getting on top of all our injuries, that kind of thing. A lot of visualisation? Yeah, yeah, we've been working with sports psychologists on that too um, because we haven't had much competition uh, in preparation for the Olympics where you're doing that visualisation to get comfortable kind of, you know, as if we're walking into a big stadium, f feeling the senses that would be around us, kind of getting more comfortable with performing on that stage again. We know that there's a hardcore group of badminton supporters here in Australia, but it's a huge sport internationally. Tell us about this huge group of fans that you have uh, because of your history and your links to a pretty well-known family inside China. Yeah, so I'm half Chinese, half Australian. My dad immigrated from Guangzhou, China when he was six years old. And through him, I'm the fifth generation descendant of a famous Chinese revolutionist, Kung Yo Wei. And I blew up a little bit in China and across the badminton um, scene when it was kind of found out that I was his descendant because he's such a um, huge figure within China. So um, through that, I get garnered a lot of um, social media following, especially across Indonesia, China, Malaysia, India. Um, so yeah, that's been an interesting experience to have this kind of big Asian fan base. Yeah, there'll be a lot of people supporting you in Tokyo, that's for sure. So being one of the newcomers without having an Olympic experience before, what is it you imagine it's going to be like? Um, we've had a lot of information given to us from the Australian Olympic Committee to kind of prepare us for, obviously, Tokyo being different to all the other Olympics. Um, we know that it's kind of going to be... Uh, trying to stay in the Australian headquarters as much as possible, just going to the dining hall, coming back. The travel process is going to be a really long one with the flight, with the having to wait at the airport to get our negative result back and then the processing at the village. So, um, yeah, we're just, we're just all happy to be going to Tokyo in the end and um, just want to be able to perform for Australia and the world in our sport. Well, great to talk to you, Gronya. All the very best. Thank you very much. Well, a year and a half after qualifying for the Paralympics in Taekwondo, Janine Watson has been officially named in the team. She shares the moment in her Road to Tokyo diary. Back in February 2020, I was at the Paralympic qualifiers for Oceania and I was successful to gain Australia's position for the Paralympics. Um, then the world kind of took a different turn and 18 months later, uh, today is particularly a special day for me because I was officially announced as a member of the Australian Paralympic team. So I have my oversized boarding pass, which we all get. Plus I also got a lovely plaque, which every member of the Australian Paralympic team gets. What I like about this plaque is that it has a print on the background, which is called the journey. 
And what I recommend you do is to go onto Google and to look up the symbolism of the print, the journey. And once you know the story behind this print, you will just sort of stop and go, wow, that's absolutely amazing. And a lot of thoughts gone behind it. And every time you see a Paralympic athlete from Australia wearing this beautiful print on their uniform, you'll have much more knowledge and symbolism and what it will actually mean for us athletes to be part of the Australian Paralympic team. So very, very excited today. Um, back tomorrow, training, even though the world's gone crazy again and Australia is pretty much all in lockdown. Uh, we just focus on the next day and then the next day and improving and before we know it, we'll be at Tokyo. There are dozens of cliches and stereotypes about Japanese culture and life that drive the locals crazy. Reporter Eleni Soltis takes a look at the most common misconceptions. Japan, the land of the rising sun. Samurai, sushi and cherry blossoms. It has its fair share of cliches, but a few of them miss the mark by a long shot. Let's start with the geishas. If you've spotted a group of these women on the street, they're more likely to be my cause. These are the apprentices of geishas. There's a common misconception these entertainers sleep with their clients. This came about in the post-war years when some sex workers introduced themselves to foreign soldiers as geisha girls. Before the pandemic hit, there was a tourist boom in Japan. Great news for the economy, but it wasn't so great for Michaels trying to go about their daily business. Now, Japan loves its robots, gadgets and intelligent toilets, and has gained the reputation of being one of the most high-tech countries in the world. But that isn't quite right. For starters, it has die-hard analog habits. Just go to Akihabara or Electronic Town in Tokyo and you'll see what I mean. Fax machines are still on sale, CDs are still popular and right up until a few years ago, so were mini discs. Flip phones are still in sight on crowded trains, paper files are fiercely defended and the hanko, a traditional stamp used to seal official documents, is widely used in offices. Now, first-time visitors are often told Japan is a vending machine paradise. Well, it is. Selling green tea, hot chocolates, ice cream, cigarettes, beer and underwear, you don't have to walk far to find one on the street, even when, well, there's nothing else. But not enough attention is given to the konbini, or convenience store. They truly sell everything. From bento boxes to business shirts and ties for the Japanese salary man who didn't quite make it home the previous night. Now to sumo wrestling. It's often described as the national sport. It's actually not. Baseball, soccer and tennis come first. There could be a simple reason for this. It isn't exactly inclusive. Women can't join the professional sumo ranks. They're still amateur athletes, and women aren't allowed anywhere near the sumo ring. This ban got a bit of attention a few years ago when several female medics rushed to save a man's life inside the ring and were told over the sound system to get out immediately. Whale meat gets a lot of attention in Australia due to Japanese whaling activities in the Southern Ocean. But per capita, Japanese people only eat about 40 grams a year. That's about the weight of a slice of ham or a single egg. Finally, tattoos in Japan are taboo. Under the medical practitioner's law, only a licensed health practitioner can inject pigment into the skin with a needle. A court ruling in Osaka left tattoo artists wondering if they needed to go to medical school to keep their tattoo parlours open. Even Japanese onsens or hot springs sometimes don't allow patrons with tattoos. But Japan is slowly relaxing its rules around tattoos because it knows full well there are a lot of inter-tourists. And that's all for this week's Road to Tokyo.